Yeah, ah, yes. right now. Brilliant. Okay, so you know who I am. I'm just going to start with a, a very quick um, video, just as an overview of the project. It's kind of a nice introduction to the project. Um, so I'm just going to play that and then we'll talk about it. If I can, hold on. Resume share. No, how am I doing this? Okay. I'm so sorry. There we go. Now, if you're heading to the Pacific island of Palau, you'll be signing up to a new pledge. Human impact on Earth's environment is one of the biggest challenges facing the world today. The small island nation of Palau was feeling these impacts acutely. Tourists were damaging reefs, littering oceans and poaching protected species, their careless behaviour magnified by large numbers. But how could a small local population with limited resources police the high volume of visitors? What if we made the tourists police themselves? Introducing the Palau Pledge, the first of its kind immigration policy for good. All visitors now need to sign an environmental pledge to gain admittance into Palau. Stamped into the passport of international arrivals, the pledge is a formal promise to Palau's children. Children of Palau, I take this pledge to preserve and protect your beautiful and unique island home. To implement this policy, government, the tourist industry and citizens were brought together. A new visa entry step was designed and issued in multiple languages and immigration processes were changed. The job that comes with the pledge is the recognition that, hey, I can make a difference. But we didn't stop at the passport step. We redesigned the tourism experience via a website, an in-flight film, a passport insert, local education, business accreditation, signage, penalties, and collateral. Launched at the UN, the Palau Pledge has been praised by international leaders and groups. Influencers helped inspire people to take the pledge online in solidarity with Palau. Are you already seeing tourists behaving differently? The awareness level is very high. The reaction on social media has been widespread. The Palau Pledge has raised global awareness of the responsibility this generation has to the next. But its biggest impact is local in Palau. I hope my children can see the beautiful place as I see today. So that's a little bit of an overview of what we did. Um, always gets me a little bit emotional. I have to tell you, again, in the dry run, I shed a couple of tears. So I've got my handkerchief ready, just in case. <laughs> uh, it was sent to me this morning by a Palauan matriarch. So um, very uh, fitting, I think. So the first get question, I suppose, that I get asked all the time is, where is Palau? And how do you say Palau? Um, some people say Pilu, it's Palau, um, and it's in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, and George could probably best describe it, but I tell people it's um, somewhere between the Philippines and Guam, and, um, and George said, you know, the reason I ended up there, I mean, my career was sort of on the up and up, I was working uh, in corporate communications, uh, global corporate communications out of Sydney for some of the world's largest brands, and then my lovely husband, who serves in the Royal Australian Navy, said, hey, how do you fancy a three-year holiday in paradise? And I said, awesome, sounds great, where do I sign? And, um, and then, so in 2015, we, we landed in the Pacific Island nation of Palau, and I was due to take a three-year sabbatical from my career. Um, and what I'd known about Palau before I got there is that it's a matriarchal culture, and that it's paradise. So for me, that sounded like the world's best place. And it does look something like this, George can attest. Um, this was what my average day was meant to look like. I was meant to be snorkeling and uh, swimming with the fish and just wandering down sandy beaches. I was very happy with that. Um, but before I left for Palau, one of the things that really interested me, I, I did some of my own research to make sure that I was um, across their culture. They have an ancient culture of conservation. And in fact, they have some very interesting world firsts in conservation. So, for example, they were the world's first nuclear free constitution. Um, that was something that was really brought about by the women of Palau. And it's something that um, they fought very hard for. Um, they were at the time uh, a, a US territory. And, um, and so they had to sort of go head to head with the United States to get that uh, nuclear free constitution. But they did. They were also the world's first uh, shark sanctuary. And they were the first country in the world to ban bottom trawling in their waters. 
So they have this rich history of conservation that goes you know, back millennia. And so this was very interesting to me um, as I embarked on this three year adventure with my husband. They are a small island nation of only 20,000 people, but they are a large ocean state. So their exclusive economic zone is actually an area um, the size of France. So um, I remember President Romain Gassau always saying to me, we are a small island nation, but we are a large ocean state. And they certainly had a very big voice in the conservation community. So in 2015, one of their landmark initiatives, and this is where my husband's job really came into play, um, as George mentioned, he was the maritime surveillance advisor. So he advised the Palau government really on how to ensure that there was no illegal fishing or illegal extraction in the ocean part of their exclusive economic zone. Um, but in 2015, just as we arrived, their traditional chiefs and uh, President Romain Gassel's government designated 80% of their uh, EEZ as uh, the Palau National Marine Sanctuary. So that means that all extraction and fishing is banned in 80% of their waters and only 20% of their waters was going to be available for local fishing. Uh, and this was a huge, huge landmark because it actually was the largest percentage of fully protected marine territory in the world and it remains so to this day. Um, so that was a, a huge win for Palau and I came into Palau at that time when the marine sanctuary was just being announced. Um, and so I suppose in my mind, I knew that Palau was fiercely protected by its people and its culture. Um, what I didn't expect was what happened next. So it was Monday morning. I think it was, uh, we'd been in Palau about a month, um, maybe six weeks. And I was sat on a beautiful beach, looked a little bit like this one. And my husband was hard at work um, earning cash so that I could lie on the beach. And, um, and I, observed some visitor behavior that was, um, it wasn't congruent with Palauan culture. So as I was lying there, I saw a commotion in the water and some visitors uh, were coming out of the ocean onto this pristine sand beach and they were dragging something behind them uh, in the water. Um, I'll just give you some context. So in 2014, Palau had 80,000 visitors. Um, and these visitors were primarily, uh, I suppose, what we'd call uh, high value, low impact visitors. So they were, they were members of the dive community. They certainly knew how to interact with a fragile marine environment like Palau's. Palau has more species of fish and coral than anywhere on the planet. It is one of the seven underwater wonders of the world. So these divers would come and they would really respect Palau and Palau and culture and respect the marine environment. Now in 2015, just as we arrived, there was a huge shift not only did we receive 160,000 visitors that year, so double the amount of visitors, but the demographic of those visitors changed dramatically. We went from very high impact, low, um, high value, low impact visitors to um, a mass tourism model with lots of package tours coming in from developing markets. So these were um, people that had never even seen the ocean before, let alone interacted with it. Um, and they were super keen to um, get into the ocean, but they didn't really know what to do whilst they were in there. And so um, just going back to the beach, I saw these visitors coming out of the ocean. And again, George, apologies, this is where my diplomacy failed me. I uh, took a run down the beach to have a little word with these visitors about what they were doing, because actually what they were doing is they were taking um, large protected clams and protected fish out of the ocean. They'd formed a net and they were dragging them out of the ocean and they were taking these fish and they were putting them into Tupperware containers. Now, the reason they were doing that is because they were going to take them back to their hotel rooms and boil them in their kettles. This was, it, and this was very prevalent. So I'd been in Palau long enough by that time to realize what was going on. And um, to say I had a stern word with them was probably an understatement and my husband's words were, please stop, otherwise um, I'm going to get deported. So that's what happened that day. Um, moving forwards one slide, if I can. So this is some of the behavior that was happening. Um, so you can see here, um, uh, the Napoleon Rass in the top left-hand corner, that is a highly protected, highly endangered fish. Um, they're, they're very ancient and they are absolutely sacred in Palau. 
Um, so these were being slaughtered, marine life were being chased and harassed for selfies, sharks were being finned, and of course it's a shark sanctuary, so that's absolutely illegal. People were stepping on the coral, um, they were breaking off pieces of coral, taking it out, um, and just generally, you know, the behaviour was, um, was uh, quite out of control, let's put it that way. Um, and so um, I realized um, that, you know, chasing visitors down beaches, being a one woman police force um, wasn't going to cut it. Um, and I'll come on to why, um, why it was very difficult for Palauans to confront this type of behavior in a second. But um, I realized that something needed to be done. And so um, I was lucky enough to attend a a party at the uh, US ambassador's house a few weeks later. And I met, for the first time, I met the first lady of Palau at that time. Uh, her, name, her name is Debbie Remengasau. And we got into um, quite a large discussion about uh, what I'd seen and she was in tears. And she said to me, Laura, my husband has stopped the charter flights, um, but we don't know what to do. We, you know, people are still coming, they're still behaving in this manner. What can we do? And I said, well, look, I work in you know, global communications. What you really need to do is you can't turn off the tap. They're going to come. They now know Palau exists and it's beautiful. Why wouldn't you want to go? But what you need to do is you need to educate them before they come in and whilst they're here. And you need to tell them what your laws and culture are. And not only that, you need to tell them what the consequences for breaking your laws and culture are because you actually have some significant financial penalties in place. Um, and so she said, um, she basically said, look, well, I don't, you don't know how to do that. I have, I have no idea how to do that. And I said, well, that's something that I can probably help you with. And my husband, I'll never forget it. He was at my shoulder in an instant and he was saying, don't do it. Do not do it. He was saying it in my ear. Don't do it. I'll never forget. And, um, and she said to me, she looked me in the eye and she took my hand and she said, please help promise me your help. And I looked her in the eye. And again, my husband said to me, don't you dare. I remember those words. And I just looked at her and I said, of course, I will help you. And we got in the car to go home. And my husband literally ripped into me. I mean, he was like, you've just made a promise to the wife of a head of state. And I think George was ambassador at the time. How am I going to tell the ambassador what's going to happen? You know, it was just awful. And he was right. You know, I made a promise. Um, it's something that the, the former first lady and I laugh about a lot because she said to me, you know, no offense, Laura, but I thought you were another well-meaning white woman who'd come here and would tell me to my face what you thought I wanted to hear. And then you would go away and do nothing. But I didn't do that because I keep my promises, even when they are big promises. So I went away and I thought about it and I knew I was going to need some help. Um, so the first thing I did was find a team in Palau. I was very, very lucky to um, be on the island at the same time as some incredible women. The first is a lady called Nicole Fagan, and she was from Boston, and her husband was a lawyer in Palau, and she, uh, she basically uh, came from the advertising world similar to me. So she was there, um, and I got her on board. I said, listen, I've made the first lady this massive promise. Do you want to help? And she was like, yep, I'm in. And then there were two other incredible women. Um, one is Palauan, Jennifer Koskling Gibbons. She had just successfully run the campaign in Palau to lobby for the National Marine Sanctuary. And she's a powerhouse. She used to work in global marketing in New York, now married to a Palauan, is Palauan herself, lives in Palau. And the fourth member of our team um, that we got on board is a lady called Nane Singio. Um, and for those of you, um, that no, she used to be the global brand director of a brand called Pantene, which is for, you know, washing your hair. Um, she's Japanese and she married a Palauan and she ended up running Palau Visitors Authority, which is similar to Tourism Australia, but much smaller. So um, I joined these ladies together and I said, hey, you know, I can see there's a problem here. We all have global backgrounds in comms. How about we do something about it? And they all said yes, which is wonderful. And the next thing we had, um, to do is find, is find uh, a willing partner because we knew we couldn't do this ourselves. So I literally phoned up some friends of mine in advertising in Sydney who work for a very large Australian advertising agency. And my words were, we have a whole country to save and we have no money, can you help us? And I don't know why they said yes, because quite honestly, if they'd known what was involved, they would have run for the hills, but they said yes. So um, we have Australia to thank for this idea in many ways. Um, 
And then the job became really finding an idea that would work. We had no money, so it had to be high impact. It had to reach 100% of inbound visitors. Um, it had to make them feel something. It had to make them understand that this was, um, this was law in Palau. But again, with no money, how do you do that? Um, so the lovely agency that we partnered with are called Havas, and they came up with 47 different ways of solving this problem. Thankfully, I only saw six of those ways, and um, we took the top three to the president of Palau. And, um, and he chose what now is uh, what now has become the Palau Pledge. So um, it was a huge, huge um, effort. It's it took three years, really, from start to finish to actually launch it. Um, but really, when we were when we were formulating the pledge with um, with all of our stakeholders, what we wanted to do was make sure that Palauan children, their voice was front and center. Because in Palauan culture, it is not, uh, you do not inherit financially, or you do, but you know, that's not the traditional notion of, of inheritance. Inheritance is a very deep and meaningful um, concept, and it means leaving behind a healthy land and a healthy ocean for your children to inherit. And so we were very taken by this notion, and we wanted their voice to be front and center. So we held workshops um, with children from all 16 states of Palau and we said to them what would you say to visitors who are coming to Palau how do you want them to treat Palau what would you like them to do whilst they were here in order to preserve your inheritance and it still gets me very emotional because these children wrote the most heart-wrenching letters to visitors um, really pleading with them to change their behavior for their own sake um, and so after, after sort of holding this workshop, we took the words from these letters and those words and that sentiment is what infused the Palau Pledge. It's, it's the pledge that you see. It's, it's an amalgamation of their hopes and dreams. Um, and so that was, that was really, really very important to us. Um, and I suppose, you know, during the very hard times, and George knows there were some, some very hard times on this journey. Um, we, had, uh, a, we had an idea that was a world first, so nobody wanted to know. We had a team that was untested, you know, so nobody wanted to know. And we knocked on every door for funding and we just got no after no after no. So we had literally no money. And um, we really had to rely on, um, in the end, I think some, some very wealthy philanthropists who had put a lot of money into the Marine Sanctuary actually came together and they felt sorry for us. So they gave us some money and the Palau government helped us wherever they could. And we, and we got together and we, we made it happen. So um, as the video showed, um, it is a multifaceted, multilingual campaign because we knew that Palau's visitors needed um, a stamp in their passport that was um, in their own language but they also needed to be communicated with in their own language at every touch point. So we've got the pledge is in five different languages at the moment. It's in English, Korean, traditional and simplified Chinese and Japanese. Um, and we needed it to, to really hit home when people sort of came in. So you can see all the different touch points um, that we've got here. We also have an in-flight video. I'm gonna put the in-flight video link into the chat later on so that you can have a look. Um, it's a mandatory video that all flights have to play as they come into Palau and it tells the story um, of a, a giant that comes to Palau. It's actually based on an ancient Palauan legend about overconsumption and the dangers of overconsumption and the giant in the video really represents mass tourism and these beautiful children, they teach the giant how to look after Palau whilst he's there um, and it's all very lovely. In the traditional legend, they kill the giant in the end, but we didn't want to do that. We kept the giant alive, all good, everyone's happy. Um, so <laughs> I will put the link in because it is actually very beautiful. Um, and again, it was shot on a shoestring budget. So um, it's really interesting. This is the Palau Pledge. So as explained, it takes up a whole page of your passport. Um, and I, and you know there were lots and lots of stakeholders involved because we had to change immigration law and policy in order to get this through. Uh, but I'll just quickly read it to you. It says, children of Palau, I take this pledge as your guest to preserve and protect your beautiful and unique island home. I vow to tread lightly, act kindly and explore mindfully. 
I shall not take what is not given. I shall not harm what does not harm me. The only footprints I shall leave are those that will wash away. And I don't know about you, but I've never signed my passport. It's an official document. Um, it comes with a sense of gravitas. And we are actually, you know, as it's a world first that we could actually make this, um, make this possible. But just for the technicalities, just for those of you that are interested, uh, Palau actually owns its own passport stamp. So asking people to sign that space in the passport is actually um, under the remit of Palau. And so that's how we were able to do it. But um, it's got, uh, yeah, as I said, it's really got a sense of gravitas about it and people take it very seriously when they come in. They're also given a little uh, brochure in their own language and that explains the do's and don'ts of the Palau Pledge, what they should do and what they shouldn't do. So these are some of the do's and don'ts. So don't collect marine life souvenirs. Do you respect culture? Do you spend money in the local community? Don't litter. Please don't take fruit and flowers from people's gardens. Um, please don't feed the fish. Please don't step on coral. Um, you know, please don't dispose of your cigarettes uh, into the water because that was uh, polluting the waterways. So just things like that. And as I said, from a psychological perspective, it was breakthrough in, in the world of media and marketing. Um, and of course, there were a lot of doubters, as I've said along the way, a lot of challenges, but um, we managed to overcome them. And today I'm very proud that, to say that the pledge is um, hugely successful. Um, it's been signed, I think, by over 300,000 people, including some very well-known people, such as Leonardo DiCaprio and the Rolling Stones. Um, Leonardo DiCaprio, I'm pretty sure, has a restraining order out against me. He, uh, he made a promise to the president of Palau in, uh, in 2015, and, um, I'm, and he said, listen, sir, if there's anything I can do for you in the future, you just let me know. And I told his manager, his agent, his PR, and all of his team that he'd made this promise and um, he now had to keep it. So it took 18 months, but we finally got him to sign it. Um, and on December 7, 2017, the Palau Pledge was launched um, and it was launched in Palau. And then it went global when um, Leo signed the pledge and a whole host of celebrities also signed in solidarity with Palau. So, and that's some of just just some of the some of the media coverage that we got. Um, in fact, I'll come on to it. I think in a sec, but I think we're at to four billion media impressions now, which is which is absolutely huge, um, and it really is working. You know, uh, it's very funny to see. I mean, this is this is crazy. This is a this is a Twitter post, I think, or an Instagram post. You can see on this, some lady has painted her toenails with the icons from the Palau Pledge. I mean, that's how successful it is. It's actually being adopted and painted onto toenails. So it's quite, quite, an, interesting, um, quite an interesting adaptation of the Palau Pledge, but I'm, I'm happy because when you look down, obviously you'll see your toes and if you're swimming, you'll know not to step on the coral. So that's good. Um, the world is now watching. I have to say, as George touched upon, um, it has been one of the world's most awarded communications campaigns. It was in fact the most awarded communications campaign in the world in 2018 and 2019. Um, just to put it into context, it's like uh, it won 16 Grand Prix. Um, and that's like winning the Oscars, the Grammys, the Golden Globes, the BAFTAs and the Emmys all at once. I mean, it was just incredible. And with our tiny little budget as well, um, it really made a huge splash. But what I'm really proud of, I think the whole team are very proud of and Palau is very proud of, is that it started a global movement. So since the Palau Pledge launched, uh, New Zealand launched the Tiaki Promise, which is non-mandatory, but still they've got a lot of money so they can make people sign it. Hawaii launched the Pono Pledge. Um, Iceland have launched a pledge. Um, I think Finland have launched a pledge. And there are lots of destinations in the US that have also formed visitor pledges that people are asked to sign to respect the local environment and culture as they move into a space. So um, it's been written about in the New York Times, it's a case study, um, and, and that's how I spend a lot of my time now. I live and breathe it, and you know, I'm raising awareness for this project uh, globally. Um, I suppose. As I said, like what matters most though is the change it's making in Palau. So we're working currently with the Bureau of Tourism and the United Nations World Tourism Organization to measure the impact of pledge in Palau. And before COVID, of course, we were doing that um, on a daily basis and then COVID hit 
and Palau closed its borders last March. And in fact, on Thursday this week, it's reopening its borders for the first time uh, to Taiwan. They're opening a travel bubble. Um, and so um, with that, um, we can start measuring the impact of pledge again um, on the environment and culture of Palau with Taiwanese visitors as they come back into Palau. But as you can imagine, um, COVID has taken a, it's been catastrophic to the economy there, I have to just say. Um, tourism is the biggest economic driver. Um, it's over half of their GDP. And um, yeah, so it's been a very, very tough year for everyone concerned in Palau. So I'm very happy that they are opening their borders, but obviously concerned about their people because they have been COVID free up until this point. Um, and so I hope um, and pray that COVID doesn't come to Palau. Um, and I just wanna, I suppose, finish with a couple of points. Really the accolades go to the people of Palau. I mean, literally they are so brave. And um, I have to say, I think it might be because they're a matriarchal culture. Sorry, just telling know mainly men here, but I'm just saying they've got um, huge tenacity and huge strength and huge vision. And they refuse actually to, um, to go against their culture when it comes to conservation. And they continually stand up to the rest of the world and say, no, you have to consider the rights of the next generation. Um, we, we're gonna do this anyway. And they set a precedent for the rest of the world to follow. So during COVID um, and just prior to COVID, we are developing phase two of the Palau Pledge. Um, and that really is about making sure that businesses educate their visitors when they're in Palau about the implications of pledge and how they can keep the pledge. Um, and we're doing that in a very warm and welcoming fashion because Palauans are extraordinarily warm and welcoming people. They don't like to confront the visitor because the visitors are, you know, their bread and butter. So um, the heavy lifting of that culturally needs to be done by the pledge and by um, the certification programs that we're putting in place. We've developed an education program. And in fact, when George was ambassador, thank you, George, you gave us a significant amount of money for uh, phase two of the Palau Pledge. We thank you, Australia. Um, you know, now Palau Pledge is launched. Um, it's still continually a challenge for us to fund the programs because Palau is a, you know, is a very small, um, small nation and they don't have a lot of money, but we continue to raise money globally to, to fund the programs. Um, and I suppose one of the things that I just wanted to finish on is before I moved to Palau, I worked in the corporate world. I never really thought about my footprint on the planet, I've got to be honest with you. Um, I worked for probably some of the biggest polluters on the planet. Um, and moving to Palau and being immersed in their culture and seeing, seeing the impacts of my choices on the next generation of Palau was a huge eye opener for me. Um, to put it into perspective, in less than 30 years, because the children of the Pacific are really on the front line of climate change, they are the canary in the coal mine. Um, and in less than 30 years, you know, the islands of Tuvalu, uh, Kiribati, and the Marshall Islands will be nearly submerged. So if you can imagine Australia being completely submerged underwater and not having a homeland to give to your children. That's the reality facing these children and, and, and the next generation of Pacific Island children. And so I spend my time now raising awareness of that, raising awareness of the rights of Palau um, and really using Palau Pledge as a metaphor to get global corporations and global governments in the developed world to take action um, to mitigate the climate crisis and to help uh, lower pollution rates um, and hopefully uh, stem the, the rise in water temperature and the rising water levels that's causing all of these problems. So um, I suppose that's really what I wanted to leave you with and just say that, you know, what I've learned from Palau, because in Palau, it is everyone's job. Um, their culture says that it's everyone's job to preserve Palau. Um, whether you're the president or, you know, or a school teacher, it's everybody's job. And I've really taken that to heart and I've brought that back to Australia with me. and. Um, and I suppose what I'd like to invite you do, to do today is really um, is make sure that it's your job to make um, very uh, sustainable choices because it all helps. And what you do here in Australia and how you talk about these issues matters. It can have an impact. Um, and I think it's every child's basic human right to inherit a healthy planet. I think you'd agree with me. Um, and they have the right to hold us accountable for that. And so 
that's what I'd like to invite you to do today. Just make smart choices um, for the sake of the next generation. And thank you so much for listening. And I hope I didn't go over time, George. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much, Laura. Um, I guess the floor is open for questions. What do I do here to see? I need to gallery. Solves, George. <clears throat> Can't hear, sorry. They need to unmute themselves and wave if they want to ask a question. Oh, okay. Yes. Please unmute yourselves. <laughs> Standard view. Laura, 